This is Derek Logue here with Tom Madison from Oregon Action Committee again. Um, this is the second half of a video that we're working on tonight. And I wanted to talk about this book. I wanted to talk about some passages out of this book that we've been reading. It's called The War on Sex. It just came out. And it's from David Halperin, I guess that's how you pronounce it, and Trevor Hoppy. And there in, there's a chapter that was written by Judith Levine. She's a really good writer. I've read plenty of her other materials. And there's a, in the, her chapter, she actually discusses, to some small extent, the reformed sex offender movement. And so I wanted to discuss some of that with Tom, you know, because he's been reading the book as well. And there's some really significant things that need to be discussed. Um, you know, she's made some very good observations from somebody who's on the outside looking into our cause um, as we're pretty much aware and she sees this as well she recognizes that our movement is pretty much consisting of those of us on the registry and our loved ones that's on page 130 um, on pages 159 through 160 she points out that those of us on the registry, we are consumed and demoralized, desperate and poor, and any activity beyond survival is a superhuman task. And that could be a good explanation as to why that our movement as a whole suffers in, in trying to get people to be involved in what we're doing. Um, and she also says that we are willing to condemn other people on the registry that are considered worse than us. And um, she also discuss, and she also dis states that the first step in politicizing and mobilizing us would be to rehumanize us. So that's what we want to talk about in this part of our our talk. So um, I'm sure with it, I'm sure that it's pretty much common knowledge that most everybody on, in this movement is either on the registry or a loved one. So I don't, we don't really have to discuss that, but. You know, how do you feel about, you know, how do you think her assessment is of our movement of being mostly, we're mostly poor and that's a huge reason why people don't get involved? Well, I think that's a big factor. I mean, we all have to put food on the table. We have to pay the rent. If we can't do those two things and a lot more of the domestic uh, needs of our family and so forth, we're not going to be able to be uh, challenging the system. So we have to be financially put together, mostly. And uh, I think because of the economy in general, as bad as it is, and then having to find work in, a already, in an already bad economy with a label on one's forehead that says sex offender, where holding a job or finding a job or keeping a job is going to be almost impossible, then you're up against some fairly steep circumstances that are going to prevent you from any kind of activism. Well, you know, finances are always thing. We always talk about money and manpower. You know, that's the two easy, you know, the, the two word um, problem that we always, that you and I always discuss, yeah. and and stuff. You know, um, it's easy to point out the physical part, but the mental part, the being demoralized, being dehumanized, being talked about as being less than that's a problem even within our own cause well and that's that's psychology and uh, you know a label as ugly as a sex offender it doesn't say former sex offender previously convicted sex offender it just says sex offender in the current tense so you're always on the verge of committing a new crime just like the myth would have you believe that we are all about in other words we're only minutes away from the next sex crime so uh, the, that myth has dominated who we are to those in the legislature, in the governor's offices, in the police captain chairs around the nation, and so forth, because this myth has uh, become that which we are. And unless we start to combat that myth and point out that, no, it's not that we are current sex offenders, we're just previously convicted people of a sex crime or sex abuse of some sort in the past, whether innocent or guilty, it doesn't matter. The fact is, when our debt's paid, that should be the end of it. Of course, that's what we're battling today, the fact that it's not put to bed, it's not done. We continue to be persecuted under a false myth that continues to mislead society and mislead legislatures who make up our laws, who make our laws. There's a couple of really good passages in this that I feel like I need to, I need to quote in relation to this specifically. You know, she said, you know, there, there's a lot of self-guilting within our movement, and I've, 
And I've seen this all the time that I don't seemingly take responsibility, and we'll talk about that in a minute, for, you know, for past offenses. She writes, you know, just as the law makes few distinctions between serious crimes and obnoxious or simply unconventional sexual behavior, even the sex offender who has harmed no one rues his mistake or stupidity, implying he deserved punishment, not just, just not forever. Uh, the sample letter to the Sentencing Commission posted on CautionClick.com, for example, does not argue for decriminalization for viewing CP, after all, only for lighter penalties. The sex offender regime promotes solipsism, docility, guilty conscience, and self-disgust in, in their subjects. Not exactly a recipe for militancy. How can such a demoralized and humiliated population be politically mobilized? And that's a million dollar question. Uh, and, the, and the way to counteract that, counteract that is to, you have to program yourself. You have to take responsibility for programming your own psychology. And when I look in the mirror in the morning, I look in that mirror, I see Tom Madison looking back at me. And that person is a good person. He's a decent human being. He's not perfect. But whatever imperfections he's had, and, and he has acted on the past, he has paid his debt to society. His registers, which were negative at one point, came back to positive. He's a positive, contributing, productive, responsible, law-abiding citizen in this world. And I look at that person, and that's me, and that's who I am. I will define who I am. Mm -hmm. And that then leads to my activism. I can look anybody in the eye, I don't care if it's a police chief, a legislator, a governor, anybody else. I'm a good person. And I can talk to you about any of these issues if you like, and we can go from there. Yeah, and I've had a rough couple of months on this because th this comes up, and, and, and I've had these attacks, as, as I've stated in other conversations, I've had these attacks even from people who identify as sex offender advocates. So. Um, what happens is I get accused of either minimizing or not taking responsibility because I don't seem to talk enough about the victims or I don't um, talk about how terrible what I did happened and, and my response has always been that look, I've served my time I don't answer to you I, I only answer to the person I harmed and, and the state and I served my time as far as the state is concerned, and if the victim in my case wants to make an issue of it, then she can then she can make an issue of it, but she chose not to. How would you answer that? How, how would you answer the criticisms? Well, I, I would probably follow in what you just said. I mean, if you've paid your debt to society, no matter what the crime is, you've paid your debt to society. There's, there's an aspect of criminal justice that says, okay, when one gets out of line in society, like being accused and maybe convicted of a crime, then there's a correction process that happens. And when that's finished, that correction process completed. When both sides find balance again, there's the perpetrator side who caused harm, there's the victim side that was has received harm, the adjustment process is to reset the registers and the balance to zero. And so that scale of justice at the end of your experience, Derek, and mine, was reset to zero. They balance the victim or the, the, the cause of the, of the victimization on the one hand and the suffering and the punishment of the perpetrator are balanced out. It's done. Therefore, you should never, you should never have to uh, account for that victim in the past, that, uh, that misdemeanor in the past, that felony in the past, if it's paid up. So concepts of basic justice are resetting the balance between the loss and the gain, making it even again. That's the completion of justice, and I think that's what's so lacking today when you have people who support the increasing uh, numbers of laws that deal with uh, victims of, of sexual abuse. Somehow they want more than the bargain. They want more than the traditional criminal justice bargain of, of well, our victim, our, our sex victim is not just a victim in a normal sense. It's a... It's a victim in, a, in, a, uh, in an unnatural supreme, supremacist sense, uh, a supreme or sacred victim. And because of that sacred victim on that side of the equation, this, this balancing of scales, this scale system that you mentioned, Tom Madison, well, then there must be an equal counterbalancing perpetrator, a demonic, a satanic, evil perpetrator. And because our sacred victim was 
was violated in some ways, then there needs to be extra legal mechanisms to counter out that balance. Yeah. So the problem is thinking of victims of sex abuse as beyond just an ordinary criminal victim and get away from this, this special sacred nature that we seem to assign to these, these uh, people. And with that comes the extra legal penalties such as the registry that we all receive on our side of the fence. You know, and you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, you know, when you hear the when you hear the criticism coming even from within our movement, you know, I personally see that as part of this demoralized thing. You know, we're taught, you know, as people on the registry, you're you're scum of the earth, you're perverts, you're this, you're that, and you know, you're going to reoffend and all this stuff. And what passes for treatment oftentimes in prison is also demoralizing and so now we talk the treatment talk so you know people so now you hear people in the movement also accusing people of minimizing and and um, denial and all these other turn all these other um, terms that you learn during therapy and stuff um, when you you know you you've spoken to people I know people call you on the phone for Oregon Action Committee and they want to get involved or they just want to talk to somebody. You know, how, how much do you really see that as, as, you know, being in play when people contact you as far as being demoralized, you know, or being self-depreciatory, like, oh, I'm just such a, you know, I'm, I feel so miserable because I can't get a job, I can't do this, I, you know. I, I get it some of the time. Um, it's not a majority of the time. Uh, mostly they're... Uh, they're hopeful that they found anybody out there that's fighting against these registries. That's number one. Uh, some of them come with some baggage, uh, and they, they, I, I try to give them the talk that I did a minute ago. I mean, and look in the mirror and talk to yourself. I'm a good person. I'm a decent law-abiding citizen, that kind of thing. Build yourself back up again, but don't, don't buy the arguments that come from the establishment. Ignore the establishment. Trust your judgment about yourself. Know yourself, as they say, right? And so, and if you, if you feel down, then program yourself by telling yourself that you're a good person. Talk to that reflection in the mirror like we talked about previously. Program yourself. Take control of your own programming. That's step number one. But to answer your question, so who are they that call Oregon Action Committee? And, and by the way, it's not that anymore. That's the old name. We've changed uh, our operations. That has become actually a website that deals with uh, activities against the wars, against the plunder of our economy, um, other activities that are different than just the registry, but it includes some criminal justice uh, activity. But uh, where you want to place your attention uh, is the antiregistrymovement.org, which deals with the registry specifically. That's anti-registrymovement.org. Uh, that's where you'll find a lot of the things that Derek was alluding to a moment ago. Well, since we're getting into the political stuff, um, and, and everything now, you know, people who know you, you know, including myself, never know you're, you know, you're a lot broader, and you don't just focus on the RSO topic and, and stuff. You're, you focus a lot more on the the great, the, the larger scale stuff. And and I know that you you got to have some appreciation for um, Levine in this in, in this book because she brings up, you know, both feminism and neoliberalism as major factors behind the SO right. laws. Right. Now for the for the sake of those who really don't pay as much attention to the political stuff other than just who they voted for, you know, maybe you can explain to people what neoliberalism is and why it's important for us to pay attention to it. Absolutely. I think the big thing to understand about neoliberalism is that it is a it is a concept that enriches the the proverbial 1% at the expense of the 99%. So it's a system of domestic and international plunder of the 99% benefiting the 1%, but especially the 1% of 1% at the very top of uh, our economic pyramid of wealth in this, in this world today. Neoliberalism deals with things like free trade. We'll get back to that in a moment. I'll explain further what that means in terms of how it impacts us. But free trade, um, deregulation of industry, allowing capitalism to run increasingly unfettered, has to do with austerity programs such as cutting back state programs like food stamps, uh, welfare, and other programs that benefit the pe benefit people that uh, can't fend for themselves very well otherwise. And um, I think that uh, privatization programs where 
form or state functions are sold off to private parties, whether you know, corporations or whatever, but the state sells off its assets and some of its servicing to private companies and individuals. So you got free trade, deregulation, uh, privatization issues, and of course what ends up at the end of the day when so much has been taken from these programs is austerity programs. Austerity uh, given to the 99% where increasingly the 99% have to fend for themselves in increasingly difficult circumstances. So now the question is, well, given all of that, uh, free trade and the, you know, the deregulation, all of that, how does that tie into the registry as a specific example? And the, and the way I have it figured out is that uh, part of the idea of deregulation and, and privatization, those two things, uh, back in the 90s when, when neoliberalism started to explode, starting pretty much, not exclusively, but pretty much with the Clinton administration when he started his, uh, his role as president in uh, 1993, January 1993, was the idea that we're going to offload government responsibility for policing and, and, and a lot of other things, but policing, if we could just hand to people in the community uh, responsibility for some of the policing, not all of it, some of it, where you knew where the bad guys lived, uh, you knew that that sex offender lived in the greenhouse over there, the, the mugger lived over there, if we could offload policing, decreasing the cost of criminal justice, then we could benefit by a more efficient society and, and have people taking some responsibility for themselves. It's kind of the concept of uh, at a grocery store where some stores ask you to bag your own groceries. Well, this is, this is that concept. I'm going to offload the cost of the store's cost of having a bagger. No, you're going to bag some of your own criminal justice bag, you know, goodies into those bags. So we're going to offload it to you. Uh, so when it came to passing the uh, uh, Violence Against Women's Act in 1994, which, in, which, was, which was an omnibus bill containing not just violence against women uh, laws, but also uh, the, uh, the Wetterling Act, which puts, uh, put uh, some teeth into a federal law that would uh, categorize and, and put into a database uh, all sex offenders from around the country and make it federalize the sex offender register, basically. And that was the head of the Megan's Act, with Megan's Law, uh, which would eventually make those same persons on the registry available to a public registry, a public online registry. But to get back to the main point here, so so off the idea of neoliberalism uh, in terms of uh, the sex offender registry is this offloading of 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 the responsibility of protecting people, part of it, not all of it, to citizens in their own communities where they could take upon themselves the responsibility of policing themselves. A kind of a, it's kind of a neighborhood watch program except specifically tuned to sex offenders in your neighborhood. That was the idea and as far as all of the neoliberal uh, items I mentioned previously, those are probably the, the specific tie-ins to why we have a registry today. Well, you know, since you put it that way, you know, it really helps me understand it a lot more because now, you know, I could see two really good examples that pop up in the top of my head where, you know, where they're doing just that with the privatization. Um, obviously, people will think prison, you know, private prisons is an example. That's a pretty good one. But, you know, closer to us, two things that I came up with just in listening to you was the state's outsourcing the sex offender registry to offender watch a private organization so now you know ohio for example pays roughly half a million dollars a year to this company that runs the software for the registry and and stuff um on an, on a smaller scale what you were seeing was was parents for megan's law a private organization right. in new york doing compliance checks operations which is the function of law enforcement and not you know not of average citizens you know and even though parents for megan's law was using retired nypd officers well you're still a civilian well, I mean, <laughs> but it's it, it, it and that's very important because what he's talking about is if you want to take what you said and broaden it it's the corporatization of our society. What used to be government function now increasingly is this is this fascist corporate governance that we have today. So Megan's uh, parents were Megan's Law organizations like that. Is it's this frightening to me, frightening corporate takeover of essential government services that uh, to me spells only misery and trouble ahead. 
Well, a Fender watch, at least not at this time, hasn't taken to the stock market. That would take things to a whole different level because Geo Group, of course, and the Corrections Corporation of America are privately tra <laughs> are right. trying to do it on the stock markets. So. Yes, they are. That's the and, and perhaps in the future, these groups we talk about would also be, I mean, becoming successful in their own. If they look at themselves, uh, becoming uh, able to raise money in the stock market of some sort, and uh, and and then franchising that idea around the country. Imagine that. So uh, those groups we talked about being franchised in Oregon, California, Texas, and so forth. That, yeah. That's where I think this could go if we're not careful with allowing neoliberalism in its application of criminal justice and, and these blacklist registries to go further than they are. We need to reverse course and get tough with understanding, you know, to understanding first what is going on as the neoliberal application of criminal justice goes and then using that knowledge and pushing back against these laws. Yeah, when you know when I grew up and I and I learned you know in my government class in school you learned the political spectrum you got radical as the far left and then uh, liberal as the not so far left and then you got the moderate and then going to the right you've got conservative and you got you got radical. That's always the traditional. So when I hear neoliberal, I'm always thinking neo obviously means new, and liberal oh. I always think is being on the left. Yeah, and that's uh, that's. Uh, I think that was designed intentionally because the 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 people that would be against uh, the corporate takeover of our country would be the traditional political liberals, which are in, which are concerned about liberty. I mean, freedom, liberty, uh, property rights. Uh, Bill of Rights in terms of civics and so forth and protecting those rights. Uh, so neoliberal, well, new liberal, that's what it seems to be. It's a political concept. Oh good, we applaud more more freedoms. When the opposite is true, what's happened with neoliberalism is it's a flipping upside down of what in the past was the, the, uh, the political in control of the economic. So we had uh, a period of time, let's use an example of the 50s, 60s, and 70s as a time when our political system controlled what economic functions were all about. In other words, it was regulated capitalism. The politics, the political layer, controlled the economic layer. And what's happened with neoliberalism, it's been turned upside down. So today, the economic goals and theories control the politics, the political. So our liberties are now in, in the hands of economic philosophy, not political philosophy, not liberal, uh, freedom-oriented political philosophy, but in economic uh, efficiency, profit, those kinds of things. That's what runs our society today. So it is in charge, the economic is in charge of the political, I think is the shorthand here. That should concern everybody. Yeah, it would certainly concern me too. Um, it really helps me understand this. Um, a lot better and I'm glad I asked that question and I feel it was important because it was written in that book and I honestly didn't fully understand it and stuff so um, you know I think you know I think that we we've covered it pretty well do you think there's anything that you would want people listening to this you know what you would want them to know in regards to how to address this issue um, and everything. I mean, what should they be looking for? How should they be keeping closer tabs? You know, what's a good, yeah. you know, what would you suggest on on being more educated on this particular topic? Well, and certainly read the book that Derek has held up several times here. It's probably one of the best books I've come across in, in 20 years, quite frankly. But especially the first two chapters where Roger Lancaster uh, writes that first chapter, chapter one in the book. Uh, very good summary, but also uh, nails uh, the key points about the registry, what it's all about, its politics, and where we're going to go from here. And uh, when you do that, I think you'll have a pretty good grasp of at least the general points. Uh, to answer Derek's question about what can we do about it and what should we do as a movement, uh, I think there are a few things, but I, I think the number one thing is I think we have to find the courage to you know, strip off the, the anonymous mask Maybe not the guy Falk's mask necessarily by itself, but the you know the uh, I'm anonymous. I'm I'm Jerry Smith one two three on Yahoo. Uh, you know I I think we have to be Tom Madison and Derek Logue in person. We have to face the public. Hi, I'm Tom Madison. I'm a registered citizen. How are you doing today? Be forthcoming. Be honest, and be able to do that at a testimony table. 
in front of a legislature or on the street and, me and meeting Joe, Joe Sixpack and his wife Patty Sixpack and, and talking to ordinary people. They may not appreciate you, they may, not, they may be disregard you or, or hold you as, uh, as uh, someone they don't like, they intensely don't like you. But I think that that process has to start and we have to be, find the courage to be who we really are and say who we really are and go forward from there. Well, you know, we, we've have been having a lot of personal conversations during the time that I've been out here visiting. And one of the things that you, you said that really stuck with me, and, 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 and to us it's common sense, but maybe to other people not so much and, and stuff. And, but something you said I thought it was really good. You do something a lot of people don't do, and that's you, you extensively read stuff from the other side. You'll, wa you'll watch videos of people you don't agree with and listen to what they say, not just to sit there and say, oh, he sucks, but you actually listen to what they're saying to see what their standpoint is. I'm a natural con contrarian, so I think in contrary terms. Whatever I hear, I mean, it could be any side. It could be side A. I'm already, in my head, I'm arguing side B. I mean, how can I attack that view, regardless of how I really feel about it or how it really benefits me? So I take a contrarian, argumentative approach to anything I hear. It could be about tonight's dinner. I mean, it, it, <laughs> what else could we have had tonight? That yeah, kind of thing. So, but, I, but it's important to voice in your mind, if you can, and, and maybe practice is required, to see the counter arguments and argue with yourself uh, in whatever is said. And I think that strengthens your position uh, in understanding both sides, because things like criminal justice and specifically uh, you know, the sex offender registry and why it came about, they're complex. It's not just facts and figures, it's emotion, it's, it's hurt, it's pain, it's, it's tears and, and suffering and all the rest of it for all of us, not just the victims of sexual crime, but also we on the registry too. Our families suffer when, when, when a member is on this public registry, the sex offender registry. So uh, I, think, I think that pretty much says it. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you sitting down and taking the time and talking with me on this. I, you know, it's always a good learning experience every time I sit down and, and we have a good conversation. Um, there will definitely be a link to the book on, you know, at the, you know, in the uh, description section. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and we'll definitely see you next time.